Good morning, church. What a joy to be here, gathered together in God's house, those of us who are here, to worship in spirit and in truth on this, the last Sunday of Easter season. Yes, next Sunday is the church's birthday, and we will celebrate Pentecost next Sunday, and the following Sunday, the first Sunday of June, actually is Trinity Sunday, so we look forward to celebrating together those events. Speaking of celebrating, we have an exciting announcement that we will recognize our eight graduates next Sunday morning prior to our 11 o'clock worship service, and we are going to invite them on campus. More information to follow in our newsletter and through a church-wide email that's going to go out tomorrow. So we're excited that we're going to recognize these eight great individuals who are graduating from high school and college. Speaking of great news, Bishop Holston and the cabinet met this past week, and they decided that we can gather once again for public worship in our respective sanctuaries beginning June the 14th. But ultimately, that decision will be made by each church council. So the worship team is meeting this Thursday evening and will make a recommendation to our church council for approval on exactly which Sunday we will gather again for public worship. And we, church, need your prayer. This is a tough, tough decision because many of you, like me, are eager to see each other and to look at someone face to face and, and share and, and pray and sing. And yet we've got to be safe. Our country is now approaching 100,000 deaths because of the coronavirus. So this is a tough, tough decision. Please pray for the worship team and church councils. We formulate a plan and move ahead in terms of when we should gather again safely in our sanctuaries, and that first and foremost is our priority, your safety and ours. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh Lord, we gather together on this beautiful Sunday to worship, and even though we are not physically together in the same building, we know that we are linked together by your Holy Spirit. And so we invoke the presence of your Spirit in our lives, in this sanctuary, in our homes, wherever it is that we are watching virtually this worship service, may your name be praised in song and in prayer and in the hearing and application of your word to our hearts and our lives. And we pray specifically this morning as we enter this worship service for our worship team under the leadership of Mary Peyton Wall, God, that you would be present in our Zoom meeting on Thursday. May we discern your spirit and put not our own thoughts and wants and desires, but look for the good of the whole church in terms of when to once again gather again to worship in sanctuary or in the youth building for worship. We invoke your presence this hour of worship in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.
our opening hymn this morning is Holy Spirit, Truth Divine, number 465 in your hymnal, and we are singing all four verses. In addition to our worship team and our church council, among other leaders that we are praying for this week of Trinity, we would like you to remember the family of Virginia Cobia. As many of you know, we sent out a email early this morning informing you that one of our longtime, lifetime members passed away yesterday. We will be having a private graveside funeral this Wednesday. And you should have received the information and know that if friends and family want to pay your respect, you can do so from 1 to 5 this Tuesday at the Shai Sooner Home at the Trenum Road Chapel. Memorials can either be sent to the Orangeburg Animal Rescue Coalition or to Trinity United Methodist Church. So let's pray for this dear St. Virginia Cobia. And we also need to pray continually for Pat McIntosh. We sent you a notice out this week, a request to pray for Pat as she continues to struggle with kidney issues and for Sandy Tomes as she has begun radiation treatment. Please pray for Sandy and for Pat. And we continue to pray for healing and rehabilitation for Jeanette Smith and Rita Moore who are home and rehabbing and we pray for their health. Also, so let's spend a few moments in silent prayer and meditation and reflection right now, meditation and reflection as we remember those right now, especially who are on the front line out there battling this pandemic. And we have recognized some of them in our Heroes of the Week and more to come. But there are a lot of individuals out there right now who are really faithfully serving their community and others as well as God in that role. And so we remember them in our silent prayers and in meditation and reflection. And we want to remember those around us, not necessarily our prayers, because again, as I said before, sometimes my prayers selfishly go like something like this. Oh God, me, 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 now. And think about that. So let's pray not that way, but let's pray for our neighbors, our families, those in front of us, behind us, those around us, and we know their needs, God knows their needs. So let's go to them, to God right now and pray. Lord, we spend a few moments in silent prayer, and we reflect and are grateful for your blessings, for your answered prayers. As I continue to call and touch, talk to and dialogue with church members, it's just really comforting and encouraging to see how high their spirits are how good they are doing despite all of these changes and all of the fears that this pandemic has brought. 
And so we are so thankful that you are healing us, that you are meeting us individually and collectively. We spend a few moments to thank you and to praise you and lift up our silent requests to you in the next minute. Oh God, in the next few minutes, we lift up privately and silently the family of Virginia Cobia. For Pat McIntosh. For Sandy Tomes. For Jeanette Smith. For Rita Moore. For all of those unspoken requests weighing heavily upon our hearts. For those on the front lines putting their lives on the line unselfishly for others. Lord, as you taught us and your disciples to pray, we say these words from our hearts together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. protection while we sleep we pray for healing for prosperity we pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering and all the while you hear each spoken need yet love us way too much to give us lesser things cause what if your blessings come through raindrops what if your healing comes through tears what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near and what if trials of this life all your mercies in disguise.
we pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness, we doubt your love, as if every promise from your word is not enough. desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to believe cause what if your blessings come through raindrops what if your healing comes through tears what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near and what if trials of the life are your mercies in disguise when friends betray us when darkness seems to win we know that pain reminds this heart that this is not this is not our home It's not our home. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest is appointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst this world can't satisfy and what if trials of this life the rain the storms the hardest nights are your mercies in disguise Good morning, church. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to John, the 14th chapter, verses 15 through 20. Let us hear now the good news. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Surrounding the disciples in our gospel lesson this morning, is a tension. There's a tension between excitement and anxiety. Not too long ago, the disciples witnessed Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. 
Not too long ago, the disciples heard the people shouting hosannas as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Not too long ago, the disciples experienced Mary running to them, proclaiming they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him on Easter Sunday morning. And since those days, not so long ago, the disciples have lived. They've lived with the resurrected Jesus appearing in their lives when they needed him the most. Filling them with a peace and hope in dark days. Yet I believe that the disciples also remained just a little anxious during these times as well. I believe they remained anxious during these times as they recalled these words spoken by Jesus. Jesus said to them, Little children, I am not with you, but only a little longer. I can only imagine what they were thinking when Jesus spoke those words to him. They might have been thinking, what do Jesus' words mean? Where, where is Jesus going? Is Jesus telling us that he is abandoning us? Are, are we going to be able to survive in this world without Jesus coming to us when we need him the most, reminding us that all will be well? It's easy for me to imagine those, the disciples asking those questions. Because as you know, church, the tension that exists between excitement and anxiety is constantly present in our lives each and every day. We've all experienced that tension. We've experienced it first and foremost on individual levels. For me, the tension between anxiety and excitement happened when I attended my first ever bonfire in high school when I was a freshman. I was so excited. I was excited about receiving the invitation from my friends. I was excited that I get to go to my first bonfire. And I was excited by the fact that my dad actually said, yes, I could go that Friday night. And like the disciples who were excited about their experiences with Jesus, I was excited by the experiences of that bonfire. The experience of being with 15 to 20 of my friends that night. As we sat around this huge fire, eating snacks, talking about random things, laughing at not funny jokes. There's times when we, those of us that could play guitar, grabbed our guitars and we began playing and singing our favorite songs. And we did this till late in the night until that fire dissipated. But I was also anxious at that bonfire. I was anxious because in all of my excitement about being invited and getting to go and, and, and joining my friends, I forgot something that night before I left. I forgot my house keys. I forgot my house keys. And so these thoughts in my state of anxiety started running through my head. Was my dad going to wake up in the middle of the night to let me in the house? Or would I have to sleep outside on the screened-in porch for the night? It wasn't a very warm night that night. What would my dad say to me when he opened that door, if he opened that door? Would dad have scolding words for me?
In church today, the tension between excitement and anxiety, it exists within our communities more than ever. We are becoming, we are excited to hear that our communities are starting to open back up, that places in our world are starting to open their doors back up. We are excited that we can go now and go out and enjoy a meal at our favorite restaurant. It's been months since we've been able to do that. We're excited that we can run down the road to the bookstore and pick up a new local book because we've probably read all the books in our house at least 50 times. Many, many of us are excited that we can go and get our hair cut at a barber shop in a few days. We're excited by the news that our high school seniors are going to have an opportunity to actually walk and participate in a graduation ceremony, which they deserve to do after four long years of high school and college. And deep down, we're all a little excited by the news that Pastor Clyde told us just a few minutes ago. We're excited that in 28 days, we can, if we choose and we believe that it is safe to, we can begin to gather again as the body of Christ and worship together in our sanctuaries. We are excited. But we are also still anxious. We're anxious as we hear statistics on the news that show numbers going up and up each day rather than flattening out. We are anxious because in that same news we begin, we are hearing of a new threat that is affecting our children and we don't know why. And so we wonder daily now, are we moving too fast? Are we moving too fast? Will we be safe? Are we ready to continue to move forward? Now, Looking back at my bonfire experience and remembering that excitement and that anxiety, I realized that I did not have to stay in a place of anxiety very long. When I got home, my dad was there for me. When I walked up to that door nervous about what might come, and when I went, when I knocked on that door, there was my dad opening the door and letting me in the house. And instead of scolding words, my dad took that moment to teach me a life lesson, a life lesson that I have not forgotten to this day. Because, yes, I don't leave home without my keys ever. But those aren't the most important lessons that I learned that night in my state of excitement and anxiety. The most important lesson was that my dad was present when I needed him and he was assuring me that things were okay when I needed it the most. So church, this is the good news of Jesus Christ today. This is the good news that we hear from our scriptures today. As we go back and we look at the disciples throughout this Easter season, we hear that the resurrected Jesus did not leave his disciples wandering down the road to the Maus alone. He joined them. He was with them. 
the resurrected Jesus did not leave his disciples in a state of fear and doubt. He joined them where they were at. And today, Jesus does not leave his disciples in a state of anxiety. Jesus again comes to his disciples and Jesus again reassures him that his spirit, his spirit will not leave the disciples orphaned. Jesus comes to his disciples in their anxiety today and lets his disciples know that his spirit abides in them now and will abide in them forever. And Jesus tells the disciples that his spirit will act as an advocate in their lives. An advocate, which means that his spirit will be their comforter that he, their, his spirit will be their counselor to guide them in decisions that they have to make, in the decisions that they face. Jesus assures his disciples that G, he will be by the disciples' side forever. And church, this is the good news for us Today, today on this last Sunday of Easter based on the lectionary calendar. Today we hear and have the assurance that the spirit of the resurrected Jesus Christ is with us. I've got to say that one more time. That the spirit of the resurrected Jesus Christ is with us. When we are lost, the spirit of the resurrected Jesus Christ is with us. When we are fearful and when we are scared, the spirit of the resurrected Jesus Christ is with us. When doubts creeps into our mind, the spirit of the resurrected Jesus Christ is with us. And when we are unsure about what tomorrow holds for us, the spirit of the resurrected Christ is with us, comforting us and guiding our decisions each and every day. So church, I leave you with this this morning. Today, as you begin to discern how to move forward in life, as you discern how to, ma to maintain your health and your safety, and the health and the safety of your family, while also discerning how you can integrate back into our community and our communities of faith, I want you to remember these words that Jesus first spoke to his disciples all those centuries ago. And the words that the resurrected Christ Spirit speaks to us today. Church, in a little while the world will no longer see me. But you will see me because I live. And you also will live and on that day you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you church remember that the resurrected Christ is with us so keep him keep him and those words of assurance with you in your heart just as you keep your keys in your pocket. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our closing hymn is number 380, There's Within My Heart a Melody, and we're doing verses 1, 3, and 4. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low, fear not I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow, Jesus, 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 sweetest name. Church, hear now the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine down and smile upon you on this day and all the days of your life. No matter what the next hour, the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year holds, know that the risen Christ is with you, comforting you and guiding you. Keep him close to you. Amen.